If anyone happens to stumble upon this video by typing in glass review, uh, don't worry. I actually am going to discuss the film in a couple minutes. Uh, to take care of some quick housekeeping first, I am continuing a series of recording myself drawing comics while I talk about various subjects, uh, anything and everything on my mind. I'm going to keep edits lean and to a minimum if I can, so that posting these videos don't take up the whole day. Please excuse the crappy video quality as well. There's something up with my exporting process that's screwing up the footage, and I don't have time to figure it out at the moment. I've currently got an Indiegogo campaign going on for my comic strip, Problematic, so hey, if you like this video or my work, feel free to investigate the links in the description and check out my stuff. While you're at it, give this video the old like, sub, and share, but only if you want to. Two nights ago, I spent some time thinking in bed after seeing some tweets that kind of got on my nerves. Some jerk was poking Ethan Van Sciver, as always. More ignorance about Nazis, Nazis and the alt-right, they're everywhere, these clowns. It's almost as if nobody ever told them the story of what happens when you cry wolf. You can take a look at the tweet itself. My response was based in utter fatigue, based on what's happening to Ethan and what happened to me on a smaller scale last month. Here's so-and-so Dave Johnson spreading the rumor that I'm a Nazi based on a 12-year-old sketchbook designed by Moose Bauman. Others picked it up and decided to try and defame me with it after Trump won the election. Here's where it started. And somebody uh, mentioned a book that Ethan worked on. I guess that was jokingly called My Struggle, I suppose. But what upset me is that I was thinking about what happens to me if I ever reach near the heights that uh, Ethan has. After decades of practice and hard work, it's so goddamn discouraging to think this is what creators have to look forward to when they reach the top. Endless pot shots and provocations from snakes and cultists, keeping you from doing the very work you love. I followed it up with this series of tweets later that night. I think I understand why creators like Bill Watterson go off the grid and stop interacting with their audiences. The mob, the grand faloon. It pokes, prods, death by a thousand cuts. It's never satisfied to allow the creator to create. It demands everything and asks for more. A million opinions and demands rain down on a creator with every piece of art. Playing chess against countless opponents, even with the perfect moves, Fatigue will set in eventually. Soon your job is explaining yourself, not creating anymore. All the fun is drained from creation this way. The death of inspiration is constant self-checking. Pruning. Second-guessing. Embarrassment and doubt lurks around every corner, crippling the creator. I don't know what the solution is. Bill Watterson, the creator of Calvin and Hobbes, genuinely saw his comic strip as a work of art not something he wanted to turn into merchandise. While I disagree with him that comics can be made into products and still maintain their integrity, I respect his position. He has an incredible essay called The Cheapening of the Comics that any comics lover should look up. Watterson quit Calvin and Hobbes when his syndicate, who owned 50% of the intellectual property, kept annoying him about merchandise meetings. All the man wanted to do was draw his strip, they wore him down with business talk until he finally had enough and ended the strip. He hasn't been heard from publicly since 1995. Meanwhile, a lot of the Comicsgate gang jokingly call EVS Caesar, though anyone who knows their history will also know that Caesar and Rome didn't exactly meet with enviable fates. With constant non-stop barrages from jealous enemies digging up past tweets and jokes, how can any top creator find time to do the job they love? You can train decades to become a comics artist, but it only takes a few days for the sparrows of Game of Thrones to force you to fail their purity test. Sir Loris of House Tyrell, you have broken the laws of gods and men. Who do you think you are? Justice. <laughs> The very thought disgusts me. It absolutely disgusts me. My conclusion that night, the way I comforted myself to sleep, 
was deciding that I really enjoy interacting with my readers, and I even appreciate critiques, but only when it's directed at the work itself and not me as a person. I don't know if it's best to ignore jerks who try to spread lies about me, but I just don't have the time or patience to argue with people who don't want to listen to my responses. My passion is in creating art and telling stories. I'm interested in comics, games, movies, manga, that sort of thing. I'm passionate about Akira Kurosawa and M. Night Shyamalan, not Keemstar. I'm not a politician. On those dire notes, I'll move on to my actual review of Glass now, <laughs> if you're still listening. In my teens and twenties, I used to go to the movies all the time. As I get older, I've become disillusioned with the theater-going experience. Too many disappointments. The last time I've been to a theater was June of 2017, I think, when I saw Baby Driver, a film which I found deeply disappointing. The only other film I saw before that was Split, the January before. Now, in order to talk about Glass, I have to talk about Split, and to do that, I have to talk about Unbreakable, so I hope you'll bear with me. Now, I love Unbreakable. Absolutely love it. I consider... I consider Unbreakable an A-plus masterpiece. It predates Sam Raimi's Spider-Man 1 by about two years, and is by far, as far as I'm concerned, the film that pioneered modern superhero films and their obsessions with origin stories. Yes, you heard that right. Without Unbreakable, which released on November 14th, 2000, there may and probably would be no Marvel Universe. There would have been no Batman Begins and no Dark Knight. We would still have Batman and Robin. The one with the George Clooney batnip. <laughs> the George Clooney batnips. These days, I'm not as easily excited anymore. By trailers and that sort of thing. Final Fantasy Advent Children was the last disappointment that turned me into a grumbling old Scrooge that I am today. I refused to get pumped about anything if I could help it. Imagine my shock then as I sat in that cold theater two years ago watching Split a shockingly decent Shyamalan film, when I started to wonder something as Casey was running away from the beast with a shotgun. I thought, you know, this movie could actually fit really, really well into... No, it couldn't be. And then, a few minutes later, in those last moments of the film, I heard that soundtrack begin to swell. Now, I can't exaggerate this enough. I've listened to the Unbreakable soundtrack countless times. Believe me when I say, I kicked my feet against the floor in the theater like a child. And I said, I think we're about to see Bruce Willis. And of course we did. I'm telling you, I freaked out. I left that theater with the biggest, goofiest smile you can imagine. Split, by itself, was a good movie. A solid B as far as I'd be concerned if I was grading it. But that surprise was one of the most pleasant I've ever experienced at my time at the movies. I had no idea it was coming. The next few days on the internet was amazing. If you navigated to the Unbreakable soundtrack on YouTube, it was filled with comments with winky faces. We all knew a great, magical secret. What a wonderful time it was to be a Shyamalan fan. To watch those spoiler reviews and be part of something that was happening. By the time I heard Glass was being made, you can understand I'd come back to my senses and put my guard back up. M. Night Shyamalan made four, yes, I include The Village, excellent movies, but he also had a very difficult creative period that's outlined in the book The Man Who Heard Voices, starting with The Lady in the Water. It's actually a really good book and worth checking out if you're a movie lover. Having seen Glass now, I'll tell you a couple of general things about the film, and then put a hard line where I'm going to openly talk about everything, including spoilers. If that bothers you, you can bookmark this and come back later, which is no problem. My personal view on spoilers, by the way, is that they aren't actually the worst thing in the world. Sometimes they can make a movie even better, like with me in the case of The Village. I wasn't going to see it, and I hadn't been a diehard Shyamalan fan yet, but a friend told me the twist ahead of time, and being ready for it, I was actually able to enjoy the film for what it was, a pleasant little period piece type of love story. Personally, I'm of the opinion that a good story gets better and better over time, but of course, you should have the option to be spoiled. 
So, is Glass worth seeing? Do I recommend it? Yes, with some qualifiers. As a fan of the series, I will say it is more a sequel to Split than Unbreakable. I don't believe this concluding chapter is a masterpiece like the original, I'm afraid to say. Unbreakable was more of a character drama that used superhero fiction to tell its story of family and finding one's place in life. Split, on the other hand, was more of a thriller that I watched, enjoyed, and may have forgotten about if it wasn't for its twist. If you're looking for an action-packed superhero movie with explosions and tons of minions getting shot with arrows by a dude who isn't even looking at them, you may find Glass a bit too slow-paced or even dull in the middle. The first and final acts are dramatic and fun. The second act is a bit sciency heavy on exposition, taking place in one setting, which I found a little bit uninteresting. McAvoy's performance as the Horde is incredible, and the rumors are true, he does steal the show. Sam Jackson was great, though a bit underutilized, and Willis was somewhat disappointing, which sucked because his performance in the original was awesome. I'll talk about that a bit more later. The film's soundtrack was decent, it had a repeating ticking clock motif that got me really pumped, especially at the beginning. But there weren't any delicious melodies, like those composed by James Newton Howard, whose work on Shyamalan's Big Four are all masterpieces. The cinematography of Glass was acceptable. I have few objections that I've I have a few objections that I've had with Shyamalan since Lady in the Water, most notably a lack of a sense of place. There needed to be more establishing shots, different settings, places where the camera could be allowed to take a few steps back and take in the scenery to let the audience feel the locations. The Sixth Sense and Unbreakable had great locations. We got to see all over Philadelphia streets, inside stores, restaurants, stadiums, offices, homes. The decorations inside each of those places made us feel like people really lived and worked there. It made us feel like we were there. Much of Glass, like Split, took place in or around one fairly alien location. Even conversations between characters, like one long interrogation in a pink room, felt a bit dull considering its length and importance to the story. The film would have needed to be rewritten, although who knows if they had the budget, to take place around in the entire city instead of one location. Unfortunately, that's all I can say without spoilers. Glass was a decent time at the movies. Not a masterpiece like the original, but worth seeing. One more time, this is the spoiler section, so you've been warned. So, Act 1. Much has been said about the film's opening 20 minutes online, and I absolutely agree. So much so, in fact, that I kind of wanted the whole movie to be like that. We see David Dunn doing his superhero thing, running a security business with his son. I wanted to see more of that. His shop looks rather shoddy. Maybe he's struggling to make ends meet. How long has David been tracking the horde? Maybe he could have come close a couple of times but failed. I would have loved to see that. David's son, Joseph, is the oracle to David's Batman, which is very cool, actually. Again, I wanted to see Shyamalan explore more of that. What's Joseph up to these days? Does he have a girlfriend? Does he keep his father's secret well? Is he tempted to tell the girlfriend? In this critical first act, we got to visit sewers, David's home, an industrial section of town. It was rad. Philadelphia sang as one of the characters. It makes me wonder if the film's entire budget was blown by accident on the actors, instead of getting permission to film in lots of different locations. If that's the case, it would be heartbreaking. The Beast has kidnapped some cheerleaders and is holding them hostage in a clay factory. These cheerleaders aren't especially good actors, unfortunately, the way that Casey, the main character of Split, was. Her friends in that film were a bit derpy as well. The fight between Dunn and the Beast was actually amazing. It was sloppy, amateurish. Both characters' signature moves were to grab their opponent from behind and choke them. 
It's nasty, ugly fighting that felt very real. I loved the fighting in this movie, and again, I wanted to see more. Way more. It was such a shame that we didn't see any more until the end, which suffered from a bit of anticlimax, and I'll have to get that into that in a moment. I especially liked that there was collateral damage in this fight. One of the cheerleaders, for example, got a table thrown onto her. I haven't seen action like that since The Undertaker fell off a cage <laughs> in Hell in the Cell. I'm just kidding. But it was good to see other characters get hit. It was very sloppy, not choreographed at all. It didn't feel choreographed. It was really, really cool. In fact, I kind of want to see more of those fights in Marvel movies in the future. Instead of, again, like I said before, Hawkeye shooting some alien without even looking at it. It was so stupid. Come on. Show some effort, man. In Act 2 of Glass, the film slows down quite a lot. While that in itself isn't a cinematic crime by any stretch, there wasn't a lot of content to anchor me down to the characters on an emotional level. They were captured and imprisoned, facing problems unique to them that weren't quite relatable to me. Although I wanted to know what happened next in that page-turner sense, a lot of the dialogue was science-y, related to the superhero's theme. In Unbreakable, Dunn's strength and Elijah's genius were only some of the pillars holding up far more relatable themes. Few of us know what it's like to be super strong or super smart, but we can all relate to being physically weak or depressed like Elijah, or perhaps look up to a father that we want to believe is as strong as Superman, or to be in a relationship that's cooled over time, one that's bordering on a breakup. We felt like participants in the story, not bystanders. Who doesn't understand the awe of Joseph watching his father lift those weights in the basement? or the pain of David trying to talk to his wife, Audrey, as he looks for a new job because his current one is unfulfilling. Consider the absolute shock of having a member of your own family point a gun at you. Unbreakable felt so real. It was pure cinema, the way that Hitchcock talks about, which Shyamalan admires. Glass's dialogue, by contrast, felt cold and clinical, kind of like its main setting, the asylum, which I found disappointing since all of its scenes could have taken place in Philadelphia, the city itself, as Dunn was on the hunt for the Horde. It could have been a simple enough rewrite, but would have made a massive difference, I think. Again, I suspect they didn't have the budget, but I think it was a major strike against the film's sense of place. On a related note, I feel Robin Wright Penn's Audrey dying off-screen, like Rocky's Adrian Balboa, was a mistake. At least in Rocky VI, we spent time watching Rocky grieve. In Glass, we barely have one scene where we see Willis talk to the back of his wife's head. Considering how important his marriage was in Unbreakable, I found this disappointing as well. An entire dimension of David was missing since, you'll remember, he denied that he even had powers after he saved his wife from a burning car back in college. It wasn't Elijah's train bombing that triggered his powers, by the way, which Elijah post posits in the third act. I found that a needless revision as well, that these powers are triggered by suffering rather than something that these people are born with. I understand and enjoy that the Horde was created from trauma, but I always felt that David was just born strong and was hiding it. It would have been cool if the Horde's modus operandi was to try converting people into turning into supers, to put it in The Incredibles terms, by making them suffer. There's possibly room for that in a part four, but considering the way Glass ended, we'll have to get into that. Casey, the main character of Split, I felt was a bit underused in Glass. Considering the timeline of the film as well, there was also a missed opportunity. I think Glass took place only a few weeks after Split. I'm not sure of that, but that's, I think, when Errant Line mentioned it was a few weeks. Casey is still in high school, but was adopted by a foster family after her uncle was imprisoned. The reason I mention this is because if she were a little older, if some time had passed since Split, there could have been a nice opportunity to have her and Joseph team up maybe get a little crush thing going on between them as they search for a missing David. 
If David goes missing and was kidnapped in the asylum, they can investigate the secret society, slowly unraveling the story. Perhaps Joseph and Casey could talk about what it's like to be normal people surrounded by exceptional people. Perhaps Casey could have developed powers of her own considering her numerous traumas, though I see how that could have been in poor taste. In a way, it almost seems to me that Casey being in the movie the way she was was kind of a missed opportunity. We needed to see either more of her or less. If more, how did the chips fall after her experience with the Horde? She still had self-inflicted scratch marks, so perhaps there was a lot of cut content. She had a critical role in disarming the beast in Act 3, but it felt kind of strange seeing her embrace the body of the man, or the people, who imprisoned her and tormented her only a short while ago. We would have needed more scenes of her talking about it, working through her trauma. Again, it would have been good for her to talk to Joseph or someone about this stuff. I haven't mentioned Mr. Glass yet because, sadly, he has been in a medically induced stupor for the entire film until now. Getting to Act 3 now. It turns out that Mr. Glass has been pulling strings and planning his escape for years, which the trailer has shown us. The way his plan is executed feels a bit imprecise, but I was willing to buy into it. It would have been more believable and cooler, I think, if he had made disciples at the asylum. In fact, until the very end of the movie, I thought he, David, and the Horde were the only patients in the asylum they were staying in. This, again, is a failing of editing and cinematography. We never once got a walkthrough of any hallways or the grounds, say like Silence of the Lambs, where we meet other inmates. What is that place anyway? A regular asylum? Or that belonging to the secret society? We never really learn. I mention a secret society, by the way. All you need to know is that they really, really hate superhumans. And they really, really like restaurants. <laughs> that's all I'm going to say because unfortunately, that's almost all the film tells us. More on them in a moment though because Mr. Glass is planning his escape. The orderlies die, as they do. I'm not sure they had to. It could have been cool if they were worshippers of Mr. Glass, kind of how the Joker became a cult-like figure to his followers in The Dark Knight. Maybe the other inmates could have been involved in the escape, but again, we don't see them until later. We could have had an Arkham Asylum type of escape for David, which was another missed opportunity for action. The film's climax rises to a pretty nice temperature. The Beast tries to escort Mr. Glass off the asylum grounds. David meets them in time. A second awesome fight occurs, full of graceless action, which is just the kind of action I like because it feels real. Mr. Glass's plan this whole time was something like a game of keep your eye on the birdie. He proposes a showdown between the Beast and David on a new skyscraper in town, a seemingly arbitrary if melodramatic target. Fighting keeps breaking out on the asylum grounds, left, leaving me to wonder if they were ever going to make it to the skyscraper. They didn't. On one hand, that's okay, but on another, we never really got to see many other locations in the film, which was something of a bummer. We find out that Mr. Glass created the Horde by killing Kevin's father on the train accident in uh, Unbreakable 1, and it's insinuated he also created David that day. While the latter is arguable, I felt the former was unnecessary, like finding out certain characters are related in Metal Gear Solid or Star Wars. It makes the world feel smaller. Not every loose end needs to be tied at the end of a trilogy, or a series of films. Ultimately, Elijah is killed by the Beast. The Beast is weakened by a hug from Casey, which was a bit weird, and David is murdered by a cop. I didn't like this. You see, Scientist Lady is a member of a secret society, remember the ones who love restaurants. Their symbol is a three-leaf clover tattoo on their wrists. I don't think this revelation was especially well foreshadowed or executed. Our main characters are killed, leaving Scientist Lady as the main character to clean up afterwards. Only then does she realize Elijah had the upper hand during the fight, recording the event on the various cameras in the asylum and streaming the footage to an outside source. 
It's later collected and released by Elijah's mom, Casey, and Joseph. I found this kind of anticlimactic. It would have been far more dramatic and exciting if the secret society was shown way earlier in the film. Who are you really? David might have asked her as she works outside the lines of legality. She might talk about how the existence of superhumans is too scary to be left unattended. Her goal was to convince him that he didn't have powers. I'm not sure that was necessary. Still, some foreshadowing wouldn't exactly conflict with that. As it stood, the ending sequence felt too drawn out. Elijah and Science Lady should have shown their cards to each other as he lay dying. He could be laughing, his mouth coughing blood as she runs inside screaming about the cameras. The world was watching the whole time. Her life is now in danger because she's failed her mission. This would have been cool and would have left us in awe of Elijah's evil genius. We would have also been hungry to learn more about this secret society. I'm not entirely satisfied by the secret society angle as I write this. It seems too comic bookish, while Unbreakable was more of a character drama, with comic book elements thrown in for flavor. The third act of the film seems very focused on lore and tying up loose ends. It left me with several unanswered questions that may be addressed in another sequel, but there's no reason we couldn't have had a few more morsels to chew on. How deep does this secret society go? Have they infiltrated world governments? Why did they like meeting in restaurants so much? Why is Scientist Lady so passionate about her job? By revealing her motives at the end of the film, we never really get to speak to her or get to know her. Perhaps she could have tried to convince David to stop his crusade. Maybe she had ki- Maybe she had family killed by superhumans. We needed to go deeper into her as a character, or at least have some hints and motives, sort of like how John Wick shows off the mysterious society of its assassins. If nothing else, I appreciate the symbol of the secret society, the common three-leaf clover. They don't like four-leaf clovers, do they? Sounds like certain people on the internet who don't like talented individuals and try to cut them down. Kind of familiar, relatable. To conclude, my overall feeling of the film is positive with hints of dissatisfaction, mostly because the first entry in the series remains the best. Glass is more interested in building its own lore and philosophy than in developing and deepening his characters. There was some recycled footage from Unbreakable's deleted scenes placed into this film, which was neat, but I recognized them immediately, and it took me a bit out of the film. I walked out of the theater wanting more. There were some excellent kernels in Glass. It may have benefited from a few more drafts, a bit more refining of the characters, their relationships, and where the story took place. All in all, I guess I would say it was a satisfying time at the theater. It would have made an outstanding superhero comic, especially these days when there's so much preachy nonsense on the shelves. The ending left things open-ended, with room to perhaps add new standalone entries in the series. Unfortunately, our main characters all died to achieve this, which leaves me feeling unsatisfied. I would have liked for David to have a more graceful end to his character, instead of being murdered in cold blood by someone dressed like a cop. If he had to die, at least he should have died like the hero he was. Who knows? Maybe Willis was asking for too much money. Maybe he laid down on the ground as shooting was finished and he refused to get up. <laughs> so Shyamalan just told another actor to drown David. I'm not even sure if that's a joke. Maybe that's what happened. I adore storytelling in all its forms. Film, comics, games, anywhere I can get it. I'm not critical of this movie for the sake of being nitpicky, but Unbreakable was such a blazing success and its watermark was so high that it would take another act of genius to reach its amazing achievements. Maybe Glass was a little too ambitious. Maybe it should have been more focused and small, focused on characters and relationships instead of building lore. I'd love to talk about it some more, but I'm sure this video is long enough. In any case, I'm continuing the series of writing and drawing and talking about whatever's on my mind. Uh, on these on this little YouTube channel, 
If you like the video and you want to see more stuff, you can let me know. Comments, likes, subs, all that crap. Uh, my Indiegogo is still running. Uh, it's going well enough. Uh, I think the time is now outpacing the funding, but there's still lots of time. Um, if you want to support my stuff, uh, consider uh, buying a book through the Indiegogo or dropping me a couple bucks a month on Patreon or telling your friends about this channel. And, uh, you know, Twitter, my name is gprime85. You can follow me there and I will see you guys next time. Thanks for listening.